And yet again, another episode of Jeeping with Cool Guy. Let's tear apart some stuff. On today's episode of Jeeping with Cool Guy, we are going to disassemble, rebuild, and then reassemble the Dana 20 transfer case. I've seen a couple of videos out on YouTube uh, of the disassembly. Um, there's one out there where the guy actually does this from a Ford. So I, since it's a Dana 20 in that Ford, I'm assuming they're pretty close, but just looking at mine and looking at the one that he had put together, there's definitely some, um, there's some similarities, but there's also some differences. Uh, the thing that I found was the most different, just from the initial observation, is the whole linkage system. So let's take this thing apart, get it back together, make it look awesome. First step, is I'm going to take off the yoke nuts for the front and back of the Dana 20. I'm going to use an impact wrench and this takes a 1 8 inch socket. It's really kind of cool how the impact wrench can remove something that's on there with a lot of torque without spinning the thing like that easily could have just ripped through my hand but it didn't it was a nice and easy way to do it mm, I can smell that old gear oil gosh that just stinks yeah. I would recommend replacing these because the way that these things are built or they're not perfectly round there's kind of a flat point built into them almost like they've been pressed in a little bit and what that does is this creates a lock nut out of these um, yoke nuts. The yoke nut for the, the front and the back of the transfer case are the exact same. So very much like what I did when I rebuilt the, the T150 transmission, I'm going to put everything into a designated box. So two yoke nuts. Now I'm going to move on to disassembling the shift lever hinge points and all the linkage that goes with that. What I'm going to recommend you do right now before you go any further is to get out a camera and photograph this thing from every possible angle. Just because, at least with my configuration, there's a whole bunch of different hinge points and components in here and I would hate for us to get to the end of this and not know the right piece to connect to what p piece. Uh, it's just it's a little bit more complicated for my simple mind to be able to tolerate. Having done a real quick preview test, uh, it looks like everything on here is 916. Now, as far as these pivot Post. There's a flat spot on the inside of this pivot post where you can use a wrench to hold this into place so that you can actually take off the, the nut itself. And that happens to be a half inch in size. So I'm going to use our just simple wrenches uh, to get everything loosened up. But once I get them moving, then I'm going to go in with the impact wrench. I just don't want to break anything off. This is that inner piece that is part of that ball hinge, ball joint. All right, so I'm just going to start disassembling this thing all willy-nilly like. Because uh, I don't really know what the terminology is for all this stuff is. One thing to take note of, this upper hinge has two washers in between the pivot arm and the the lever itself okay for the upper shift arm doesn't seem there's no there doesn't seem to be a nut on the other side of this thing but it seems like it's a threaded bolt so i guess it's threaded into the other side of this yeah it's just a long carriage bolt fine thread moving on further down into the shift arm linkage Wow, that one's on there. Uh, lock washer on the inside of the nut. I'm going to take off the cotter pins of this lower linkage arm first so that this 
arm swivels freely. All three of these lower pivot arms, uh, I'm guessing these are the shift rails for the, the transfer case. All three of these are just simple cotter pins. All right, once you get those three cotter pins straightened out so you can pull them out, find this other cotter pin, which is, I guess, on the left shift rail. I guess this is left. Pull these suckers out. On each one of these cotter pins, there is a just a washer in between the cotter pin and the, the pivot joint. Where'd that one go? Three have been removed. Washers have dropped off. Now that I'm looking at it, this outer one has two washers on it. One of them is one of those wave washers. Yeah, that's just your standard washer. Right one, standard washer. Center one, standard washer. Left one, standard washer. And a small wave washer. I just removed the uh, cutter pin for this inner hinge. Standard washer and a wave washer. So now that we remove those, I'm gonna pull out the pivot posts. In tandem with what I had previously said, this, the two outer linkage points also have a spacing washer in between the, the two linkage arms, brackets, and then the center linkage arm has two washers, one on the top and one on the bottom, and both of these are wave washers. I'm going to take off that lower bracket. It looks like the spacing on all these are equal. This is starting to make sense the more I look at it. The left shift rail has that spacer washer in there because the shift rail does not come all the way out and uh, link up with this support bracket, this upper and lower support bracket. The right shift rail is longer and it connects with the pivot point, or the pivot pin, in this right side shift rail and bracket. The left shift rail, much shorter uh, bracket arm, and again, uh, this pin, is the same length as the pin on the outside of the shift arm bracket. Okay, now that we've got pretty much the inner linkage to the shift rails undone, let's see if that has released the pressure to the... Oh, well, all right. <laughs> yeah. Note to self. Uh, take all the linkage off before you try and remove this arm. That was mindless. So now I'm going to take off this back cotter pin. Uh, for this this hinge arm, this linkage arm, and there is a washer in between the cotter pin and pivot arm. Let's see if I can get this thing off again. Um, I'm going to heat it up real quick with some heat. Okay, that definitely loosened it up. That helped. Uh, this is also a very short pin. The left shift rail are the two longer ones. The center one and this right shift rail are the two shorter ones. All right, let's see about taking out this main support arm. Uh, this is a half inch head. Using a wrench and a hammer kind of operates a little bit like a um, impact wrench. Two. It is a hollow tube. And like everything else, I'm going to powder coat that. Bag and tag all this stuff, guys, or bag and box, or box and tag, whatever. I'm going to get a puller, and we're going to take off. Okay, so apparently we're not going to get a puller. This uh, yoke just comes off nice and easy. All right, if that one came off as easy, let's see if the back one will come off as easy. Okay, back one came off easy. Cool. See what kind of marking? Yeah, this has got the exact same... Marking so 629-1 and an 18 at the top. So it looks like the yoke for the front and the back are identical. Uh, actually, as I just flipped that over, I realized that there is a washer on the inside of the yoke uh, in between what would be the mounting nut and the yoke. Nice thick washer. All right, I'm going to take off this back. 
assembly here. These are all 9 16 inch head bolts, coarse thread. Looking at this, I'm about 95% sure that this thing has never been touched outside of the factory. Rubber mallet to hopefully break the, the gasket. Okay, so like normal, I got a little bit ahead of myself. I cannot remove this support plate for the shift linkage because the two shift rails are going to be connected on the inside to the shift forks that operate the, the, the gears that mesh to control the, the front, dri front wheel drive and the rear wheel drive. So I have to flip this thing over and remove the bottom plate, I guess it, you call this the drain pan, of the transfer casing. These are all one half inch head bolts. These are all flange bolts and they can be about three quarters of an inch long. Simple mallet, break the gasket, pull that sucker off. Yeah, this thing has never been opened up before. I was kind of hoping for a magnet inside of the drain plug. It looks like there is actually a magnet in the drain plug, which is cool. Nice to have. Ah, oh, that smells so... oh my god. <laughs> uh, here we are, the inner workings of your transfer case. They all look in really good shape. I'm not seeing a lot of wear and tear pitting on the gear teeth. And just like my gearbox, it probably didn't need to be overhauled, but I would like to put another 150,000 miles on this thing. And if that means that I need to replace the bearings and get all the inner workings, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Before we go any further, let's get rid of this nasty gasket. I just want to get us started and see what this thing is made out of. It's like petrified cardboard. Now that we got the petrified gasket removed, I would like to take off this backer plate first. These are 9 16 inch head bolts. Oh, I didn't just do that. Yeah, I just dropped one of the bolts down into the case. Not a big deal, just annoying. Now take note, these bolts are different than the other ones. There's no flange to them, there's no uh, beveled head. Cap comes off, and then here are the shims. Take these off. Be careful with these. I don't know if I want to have to replace these if I don't have to. Let's see, it looks like there's a total of three of them. So I'm going to keep them, one, in the exact same order as I took them off. Oh no, man, I was totally wrong. God, there's a bunch of shims on here. Wow. These ones that get really close in are ultra freaking thin. Be very careful when you remove these things. So it looks like there's a total of, for mine, and all these are going to be different, but the tolerances for mine call for four, five different shims, and these things are real, these backer three are so super thin. Think about paper thin. Be very careful with these. I don't want to bend these things up. So I'm going to take this, keep all these together. To remove this rear housing cap, you have to uh, remove your speedometer gear. This thing's a pain in the ass. Why? Because it is inset inside of this little recession area that an average seven eighths inch socket head cannot fit into because of the spacing between the gear and the outer wall. Maybe you need a specialty tool for it, but it's a seven, seven eighths inch socket. So to solve that problem, I just took an extra seven eighths inch socket head and ran it through a bench grinder and just shaved down the outer lip of the socket so that it now fits inside of that housing. All right, there's your speedometer gear. So I wonder if it's 
just this and this or do they come as a unit? Before I move on, I did want to point out something in specific. This is actually the gear. Your uh, speedometer cable inserts into the end of this. And if you actually look at your speedometer cable, you'll notice that the, the shaft end of that is a square pointed piece. And that square wire goes into here and then uh, threads down on the top of this housing. And then the speedometer cable registers how fast this thing is spinning on the inside of the transfer case. These are 9 16 inch bolt heads. Now as I've taken those five bolts out, there is one longer bolt. It looks like a regular type bolt, uh, grade 5, where the other ones are more of the thicker square headed uh, when I say square, meaning that they don't have any like flanges on them or anything like that, but you can definitely see the difference between the two. Rubber mallet. All right, uh, I was a little weary of this because I don't like hammering on metal, but I can't figure out any other way of getting this off. You just have to find a place where you can get um, some kind of a punch on the ledge or the edge of this outer housing and just keep knocking against it until you're able to break that off. Man, this thing is on there. The reason this is so hard to get off, one, it's been on here for 40 some years, and two, this outer housing seats inside of this. And this uh, is very tightly fit, it fitted in there, so you can't really kind of knock it back and forth to kind of slowly get it out. You have to be able to get it an angle on it to where you're forcing it out. Another destroyed gasket. Now, uh, I think the next step is to remove the counter shaft. First thing you need to do is remove this bolt right here in the middle that actually has the identification plate on it. This is a half inch head bolt. When you remove that, you get three things out of it. You get the bolt, you get your identification tag, and hopefully yours is still readable. And then you get this locking, what I call it a washer, um, that fits underneath the lip of the counter shaft. So this is what uh, keeps the counter shaft from rotating. So I've been calling this thing the wrong component the whole time. This is not the counter shaft. This is the intermediate shaft. Next step is to grab yourself a soft metal punch. I've got a brass punch and you want to drive it out through the back of or through the rear of the transfer case. So the rear of the transfer case is going to be the one that we just uh, took that rear drive out of um, with the speedometer housing in it. As soon as you get this shaft through you're going to hear a whole bunch of needle bearings fall through. They're going to be on the inside of this. Oh, there they go. There we go. And then everything falls. Intermediate shaft. Looks like there's some kind of an O-ring. On each side of this intermediate gear, uh, there's a thrust washer. What I'm going to try and do, or I'm going to try and pull this gear up and out while keeping all the needle bearings inside of the housing. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but it just might make cleanup a little bit easier. And there should be a retaining ring on each end of the gear that's holding the bearings, needle bearings in. And there's that retaining ring. I'm going to drop it in this nice little tray here. That way it keeps everything nice and concise. Cool. There we go. There's all of our needle bearings. There's all of our retaining rings. So the way that this works is inside of the gear on the far end or on this end of the gear, there's a retaining ring. And then there's a whole bunch of needle bearings. I'm gonna say 25. And then there's a middle uh, retaining ring. Then there's another set of needle bearings. And then this 
last retaining ring, which fits right there. Last but not least for these this intermediate gear are your two thrust washers. These things are seriously heavy duty. These are steel. The ones that came out of the T150 were plastic. They have this tang this, that fits into these lo locator slots inside of the casing. You'll also notice that the thrust washers all have a groove. Uh, those grooves face inwards towards the gear. And what they do is they provide uh, channels for the, the gear oil to circulate between all of the gears, the thrust washers, and so on. Now, looking down inside of the, the box itself, these are the two shift rails. This is uh, the longer of the two shift rails. This shift rail controls the, the rear gear. The back one, that's kind of hard to see, controls the engagement of the front four-wheel drive, this gear in itself. These are, the shift forks are held into place by a he Allen head screw that goes down into the shift fork. You need a long shafted Allen wrench to be able to disengage this shift fork. Since I've got everything else removed, I'm gonna take out this gear from the rear part of the transfer case because I can just get that easily off the shift fork. I kind of wish that I would have done that before because what that did is it gave me the ability to lower this shift fork even further and then I can get an angle to get a much stronger Allen head socket instead of just like a, a small L wrench in there. So now I should be able to get this shift fork out. All right, here's hoping. Oh, thank you. Yay. Boy, that thing was in there super tight. So there's the screw that goes down into the shift fork into the shift rail. Apparently something else that I forgot to do in the sequence of all this is you need to remove this front oil seal. So just grab a seal puller and pop that thing out. Okay, so does that give you any indication of how messed up this thing was? That was just trying to pull an oil seal. I don't have any idea what was going on here. How could that have been in there that badly? But I had to obviously mangle this thing using my puller just to get it out. There wasn't enough room to get my uh, 10 pound um, slide hammer seal puller out. I had to use this thing and my God, that's ridiculous. What I'm gonna do is drive this shaft and push out the retaining race that's holding this rear bearing in. Okay, now it looks like I need to remove this rear bearing. All right, I've got my uh, bearing splitter and I'm just working it to pull it off the back of the shaft. All right, I got the bearing separator all the way down and then it started really tightening up and I couldn't figure out why. Well, the bearing separator had gotten to the point where it had gotten all the way behind the bearing and it was now clamping down on the drive shaft. So that's not good. So now I have to back off this bearing separator and use like a three jaw puller and pull the bearing off. Okay, I have to say that this has uh, gotten a little ridiculous. The slot that was opened up by the bearing separator is just enough to where I can get the edges of a three jaw puller in there. But anytime I apply pressure to it, then they just kind of pop out. So I had to figure out some way of engineering some kind of a strap that holds all the, the arms into place. So now I'm just gonna see if I can just crank this thing off. There's a step, once you get the gear taken out and the shift fork disconnected, you're supposed to be able to take this rear shift rail, rotate it a quarter of a turn counterclockwise, and pull it out. I, I can't even get, I mean, I can get it to rotate, but it ain't coming out. So I don't know what to do there. Have to figure that out later. 
but I guess the next steps are is to flip this thing up to where the back part of the transfer case is pointing down, put it up on wooden blocks or some kind of a support system underneath, and then hammer the front output shaft down through the casing. Kind of makes me nervous because you're putting a lot of pressure on that shift fork because the shift fork isn't it's just holding up all of this stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the uh, the old pinion nut as kind of like my buffer and I'm just going to hammer it through. Holy crap. It worked. Unscrew the, the nut. You could do it with a, a probably a dead blow hammer. All right, you can pull the whole shaft out. Okay, I guess then you can just take all the stuff out. So the configuration from top to uh, top down, there's a spacing washer uh, that has a beveled edge on both inner parts, so I don't think it's uh, directionally oriented. Okay, here's the, the center gear. Oh, hey, that, that's interesting. There's a spacer washer. This is obviously thicker. Got your forward facing bearing. That sucker's gone. And then you just lift this thing out. So now we can remove the shift fork for the front gear. The thing that I don't get is this is just a pain in the ass angle. Why would you have done it this way to where you can't get to it? These set screws are 3 16 inch Allen wrenches and that kind of sucks because I can't get in there so I'm going to have to use just a straight up Allen wrench. Let's hope this one comes out a lot easier than the other one did. I kind of see why they want you to be able to remove that rear shift rail because that way you can rotate the whole housing so that you can get a better angle on the set screw down in there. So I've got a long, as long of a shafted 3 8 inch L wrench in there and you just have to figure out a way of being able to get enough torque on that thing. The way that I did it is I got a, used the round edge of a long wrench and just pushed it till it let go. Sorry, I just, there's no angle for me to be able to give you a good visual on this to make it make sense and to help out. But I think there's enough here to get the idea. Got that out. If you have one of these tools, it is a right angled driver. I got this from my grandfather and I've never found a use for it until now. And I used a 3 8 bit and I was able to just unscrew it that way. As opposed to just sitting there and going like this with the Allen wrench, the L wrench for like an hour. So that was kind of fun little finding. We can slide the shift rail down to the end. No, off that piece. Inspect these things as you're going along. So this is the rear output shift fork. This is the front shift fork. Then you can just slide your whole shift rail assembly out through the front. There's one last piece and it's the bearing race cup for that front bearing on the uh, or front drive shaft. You just need to take a uh, punch, a bearing punch, and pop that out. And then at that point, you're pretty much done with the main casing. I'm going to obviously go through and degrease this thing. I'm going to get rid of all the old gasket material, lightly sand down all of these surfaces so we can get them all cleaned up. And then, like the uh, the transmission that I just did, I'm going to powder coat the whole outside of this thing and get it immaculate. This, on the other hand, I don't know what to do about this. This one's, this is complicated to me. Okay, so what I've figured out, I put the thing into a vise and rotated this counterclockwise, quarter of a turn, hammer on it with a rubber mallet and it wasn't moving. So, I figured there might be like a detent or some kind of a poppet in the middle of these two. Maybe very similar to the transmission. So I decided to rotate this one and that one gave way a little bit and then I was able to push this one back into that spot on the shift rail and then that basically pushed that locking component is on the inside and then I was able to move this one into the open position 
and out. Maybe if I had tried to uh, get this shift rail while it was still in the case into that unlocked position, I might have been able to pull out this shift rail. I think my problem was is I just had these too far in and I didn't have anywhere for or any way to release them. So lesson learned just before I pull this thing out, there are these two aluminum caps. These are called the poppet tanning caps, I guess, whatever. These are aluminum and they're very similar to the caps that are on the Dana 300 and the, um, the, the T150 uh, for the TCS plug. Very light aluminum, so when you pull these things out, be very careful so that because you'll crimp them so super easy. But those are in place so that when you pull out the shift rod, the poppet doesn't go flying because it's in there with a spring, and that spring is going to pop that thing out really hard. So when you're pulling this thing out, ow. And you do not want to lose that poppet. Land on the floor right below me. Actually, I think what happened is, is it just came out through the shift rod hole. So when I pulled out this shift rod, you can see how that locking pin shifted over into this shift rods area. Once I remove this other shift rail, you can kind of feel it when the it presses the poppet into place. Cover up so you make sure that the poppet doesn't go flying. There's my poppet, springs down in there. You can pull up through that hole, through the top. Now, if you wanna go all in and take everything apart, you can remove these back thimble covers. The way to do this is with a seven, or yeah, seven sixteenths socket head. You put that inside the thimble, then you use a, an extension like a socket extension, and then a punch with the socket extension. And then you just use the shift rail uh, holes to punch that thimble through. And there you have your thimble. These are fairly thin metal, so I can see why they don't want you to just use a punch by itself, because you'll break these things or punch through them. But this is the thing that the shift rail um, slides in and out of as an extension of the case. Last but not least, we need to take apart the uh, rear output shaft housing. I'm going to use that same nut that I drove the uh, other output shaft out of with. And as far as I can tell, there's not a lot holding this in other than a bearing race on the bottom part of this right down here. So I think that we just need to just knock this thing through and the whole thing should come out of this housing. And hopefully we can just take the rest of it apart. Yeah, that's all it is. Should be fairly easy to do. Obviously take that nut back off because it's not gonna fit inside of the seal. There. Um, and at this point, I think all you need to do is to just take, uh, need to remove the seal on the top part of this, and then that bearing will come out. And then need to use a punch uh, to punch out the races. But here's your main shaft. Um, this is your speedometer gear. Uh, apparently, there is a uh, washer. I'm guessing, yeah, there's a washer on both ends of this. Huh, interesting. One has a bunch of shims. Take note of that. I don't think you're going to want to lose those shims, nor get them mixed up. And then you'll just need to separate this bearing from this main drive shaft. So let's take out the seal here real quick. These seals, at least on these output shafts, uh, housings are just ridiculous. Like, I could not pull this thing out. It looks like I tore through it with a hacksaw, and I was using a seal puller. That wasn't going to work. So, I just flipped the housing over, used the bearing as my backer piece, and then I used a 50 millimeter punch and just punched it out 
through instead of trying to pull it. It was just ridiculous, so forget that. This is done. Now I'm going to, let's see, there's a, there's a race here, there's a race here. So I'm going to see if one of my press cups will fit perfectly inside of that one. Nope, that ain't going to happen. Now, I'm going to have to use a uh, brass punch and punch out just the lip of that. The uh, race, there's just a slight edge there that you can get to. A pain in the ass. Just use a punch and work your way around the edge. I'm talking about not wanting to let go. Wow. <sighs> Now let's flip it over, do the other side. I'm probably going to need to get a wood block to elevate this thing with. Anybody want to take bets on how many times it's going to take me to hit this thing before both of these blocks fall over? I'm amazed I got it this far. Oh, there we go. And there she goes. One last thing before we sign off for the night. The detents or the locker pins I can't figure out how to get them out because there's these two little caps that hold them in and they're not coming out so I'm not gonna worry about it um, if that's the only thing that I can't take apart and I can still powder coat this and it's not gonna affect anything okay fine great not a big deal so my parting words with this project is very much the same as what I had said with the T-150. If I can do this, you can do this. And the exciting thing about it is, is that this is going to save you so much money. Um, it may, you're going to have to put in some time, but hopefully your time will be greatly reduced because you've watched this video. Again, if you have any comments, improvements to the process, uh, questions, maybe something I didn't cover that I I'm not aware of as of right now, put it in the comments. Um, I'd love to hear back from you guys. Uh, like everything else, we're all kind of learning how to do this together. And like and subscribe. Why do I want you to like and subscribe? Because it helps me out. It helps the CJ7 community out. It helps everybody out. Super excited that we did this. Got it all taken apart. Didn't break anything didn't do any physical damage to ourselves, uh, and we learned some really cool stuff. Looking forward to the next episode. See you soon.